All right, hello everybody. Dave Foster here, and welcome to yet another episode of Geeks and Gear. Uh, today, I am going to be interviewing Ben Swan, who is the founder of the Truth and Media Project. So let's get started. Okay. All right. So I am here today with Ben Swan uh, of the Truth and Media Project. Uh, I've known Ben for a while now. He's a great guy. Um, and so, Ben, what I basically want to do is first get control of my mouse <laughs> so that I can... So my mouse just stopped working. They'll edit all this out, so don't worry. <laughs> for, all, for all you watching live, you get to see this stuff, but after it's edited out... Yeah, this sausage is made. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to see if I can use this trackpad real quick. For reason, reason, mouse just quit, and I need to pull you up on the screen. There it goes. Okay. All right, so Ben, if you don't mind, uh, you know I know who you are, and, and I know a lot of people watching probably know who you are, but we have some viewers that you know they don't know who you are. So if you could tell us who you are and and what you've done, and then about the Truth and Media Project. Sure, absolutely. Well, my name is Ben Swan. I'm an investigative journalist. Uh, I spent 15 years in broadcast media. I started out as a news photographer, worked my way up through the ranks, became a, a one-man band, a uh, full-time reporter, a morning anchor, a primetime anchor. I worked for NBC stations and Fox stations in Texas and Ohio. In Ohio, I was working for the Fox station here and started a segment called Reality Check, and it just kind of blew up as we were challenging, um, you know, stories that mainstream media wouldn't cover, talking about the, the 2012 presidential election. Uh, we started getting views from 140 countries, over 10 million views on YouTube, uh, several million more on our website. We were getting 3 million views a month on our website. Uh, just really saw this explosion of hunger for people to say, we want to see stories that really we're, we're not getting from mainstream media. So in May of last year, I left the station and started out on my own on a project called the Truth in Media Project. And the idea is to do exactly that, to continue to cover stories that mainstream media won't cover, to talk about issues that we think are affecting the lives and the individual rights of the American public, and breaking through a left-right paradigm that we think is a false paradigm in politics and in media. And, and I think that's absolutely great. You know, that's, And that's personally one of my feelings is that the media – uh, is doing the biggest injustice to the American people because they don't report on things and, and an informed society obviously uh, takes more action. So That's right. well, they don't want you to take action, right? Exactly. You see is based on the idea that you know the, the, the politicians love the fact that we have an electorate that is really apathetic and, and people are not involved in the electoral process. They don't go out and vote. Uh, you know right now 50 percent of the American public, uh, voting public, are no longer registered with the Republican or Democratic parties. 50% of the voters in the United States. Now, if you watched any mainstream media, you would never believe that number. You would think, oh, well, no. I mean, we're in this cosmic battle between red and blue, right? This arm wrestling match between the two. And that's not the case at all. The positive side is, for those of us who want to see change in the system, um, because there are so few people engaged, it doesn't take a whole lot of people to get engaged and to actually make a change. Yep. And we've seen that with uh, just the... Uh uh, the cattle farmer out there, the Bundy, uh, there was like, what, 800 protesters there, and they were able to actually uh, make some change there. Absolutely, but, but keep in mind, I mean, go back five years ago, and there's no way you could have gotten 800 people organized that way, because again, mainstream still didn't cover this story. It was a social media, new media phenomenon with that story where people were able to organize, work together, and to get out there. And despite all the things that media will tell you about how dangerous these people were, Go back and, and take a look at what happened. The only violence that took place happened at the hands of BLM agents. None of those protesters uh, conducted themselves in any way that would be considered violent. Okay, so now to get into the, the meat of the interview here, what, what I uh, want to ask you are, you know, as a journalist, what are the, the gadgets that you have on you at all times uh, to, you know, if you're out doing reporting or whatever, I'm sure one is your phone or whatever, so what are your three favorite devices? Okay, well, first of all, my probably my favorite is is my Samsung uh, phone, which you know you have everything on it, right? So you've got email on it. I've got uh, all my social networks uh, connected to it. 
Uh, I use the camera on it quite a bit, which it's a fairly good camera, so uh, that comes in handy, especially for snapping pictures. Video, not as much, because even though the video is good, the audio isn't good. And so, you know, I, I, I want to see better uh, audio. Uh, second device I always have with me is a MacBook Pro. So I do cross over. I'm not a, a exclusively Apple kind of guy, right? Some people, it's like blasphemy to mix those devices. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I have the MacBook Pro, and so I, I use that constantly. Always have it with me, uh, morning, noon, and night. Uh, and then the other device that I don't actually carry with me that often, um, because I don't use it that often, but whenever I travel, I have it, um, is my uh, my GoPro Hero, which is the, that little GoPro camera. And I take that, especially when I'm traveling with me, because great picture quality. Uh, it's so portable, so easy to kind of tuck away, and you never know when you're going to need it. Yeah, and those things are awesome. I actually, uh, I, I actually started, I don't know if you can see this, um, using the Polaroid. Let me get it off my table here. This little gadget. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's kind of like the GoPro, but yeah. I can mount it to, you know, a helmet or even a, it's got a belt buckle thing. Oh, uh, nice. the, the portable cameras are amazing. And it, was that a Galaxy S4 you had or 5? Or? Actually an S3. I didn't go with the S4 because when I was going in there to buy it, the S4 is the one where it tracks your eyes when you're reading. Yep. I didn't want my phone tracking my eyes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna buy I'm gonna skip that. I'll go with the less advanced model. <laughs> okay, so as far as apps, what are your the the three uh, best apps that you use on your phone or or MacBook or whatever? Well, okay, uh, good question there because you know I am very critical of a lot of the free apps because I know that they're gathering metadata on me, so I try to stay away from a lot. <laughs> Probably the apps that I I use the most often, especially on my phone, are my social media apps. So Twitter. Uh, Facebook Pages Manager because we have two different uh, pages which we're constantly having to to update and, and really that's where the majority of our our contact uh, with folks comes from. You know, trying to do more with Google Plus and the uh, the app that kind of comes along with that so I can manage Google Hangouts. But man, that's all new to me, David. You're the, you're the genius. <laughs> I mean, you're you're like the guru of Google Plus. Those guys ought to be. I'll be dumping serious money into what you're doing because who? No one understands Google Plus. <laughs> well, and you know that's funny because that's what I found. I mean, I've I've been uh, talking to some of the people actually that work at Google, and and you know I just noticed that there's so many people that because there's so many facets to Google Plus, it can be very overwhelming when you look at it because there's events, there's Hangouts, there's the news feed, there's the circles, and there's all these different things. So we're trying uh, at GeekBeat to work on some content to make that easier. But, uh, yeah, it, it, once you get in, like I, I had a problem too jumping in, but once yeah. I did and it just started doing it, now it makes more sense. So we'll get you there, Ben. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to rely on you heavily because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I think especially if you're more in a, a Facebook mentality, it's so different uh, from Facebook. It's not just another kind of uh, social network. So it's, a, it's more advanced. It seems to work really well, but... You know, it's just making it work that's the challenge. Yep, no, I, I completely get it. And the thing is, you know, it's 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 so tied to search because, you know, Google is is known for search, and so Google Plus is kind of, you know, carries that over. So it's it's really important uh, that people have a presence there, but I totally get what you're saying about it being different. And so I would, my, my only other app that I use is uh, an app called Shoot Bubble. If you've ever played Shoot Bubble, uh, uh -uh. <laughs> that's my, that's my de-stressing app. So you sit there and, and pop the bubbles so that, uh, you can de-stress. I've never heard of that one. I'm gonna have to check it out though. That sounds. I don't. I don't like really intense games. I'm not like a phone gamer. I probably got one game, and I think it's uh, Words with Friends or something. All right, all right. So you know, well, this you know not I'm not. Good, this is just like a. It's kind of like like a Tetris type of thing. So my okay, son, yeah, I like Tetris. My son is one. He's downloaded on my iPad. So I use an iPad for a teleprompter, and uh, my son is always stealing it. And he downloaded uh, a game called Sniper Shooter. <laughs> <laughs> and he got me kind of addicted to sniper shooters, so I don't know if I'm supposed to say that on air or not. But so, oh, yeah. that's fine. <laughs> sniper shooters, another great game to get hooked on. So, um, as far as the uh, what you said, using the iPad as a teleprompter, are you using it and laying it down in something that has a mirror? Or are you actually just setting it in front of your camera? Uh, no, we actually have a, the full um, teleprompter rig, so it's all set up with the with the glass. It has the mirror. Uh, we put the camera behind it, so you're looking directly into the camera. Uh, it's a great, it's a great teleprompter system, and then the the app is free. The teleprompt app, uh, well, maybe not free, maybe it was like two bucks or something, you know. But it's nothing for it. 
uh, and it works as well as anything I've ever used in professional broadcasting. Yep. No, I, I actually, if I if I had it in here, I'd show you. I made one out of a picture frame and the regular glass, but I have one that my camera sits behind too that I use for, and then I put little plastic mounts for my iPad to sit into, and it works perfectly. And I, it would cost me probably thirty-five bucks total with the glass and everything. Uh, to yeah, do so, I mean, that is, and it's just as good as anything you're going to see in a, in a professional uh, news station or news network. I mean, they're spending probably twenty thousand dollars getting those teleprompters put in, and uh, you know, a guy like you can make it for thirty bucks. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's what I was saying. Like I saw on Amazon, I saw them for like seven, eight hundred bucks, and I'm like, I don't, I don't see what's so special other than it looks like it mounts right to the tripod. But I just put mine on a tripod and. And it works perfect. So you know, people are out there spending seven, eight hundred, and like you said, twenty thousand for the professional, and you yeah. know, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> when they could, they could have the exact same thing for thirty-five bucks. <laughs> well, what's kind of funny too is, is I've been in stations where if a pro teleprompter goes down, um, it takes weeks, if not months, for engineers to get around to fixing it, sending it off. You know, put this thing on a on a stinking iPad, <laughs> and uh, you know, it takes twenty minutes to get something like that fixed. And if you can't, go buy a new one for three hundred bucks, and you're done. Well, now, didn't you? Th I don't remember if you told me this story or if I read this somewhere, but didn't uh, when you were doing uh, reality check, didn't the teleprompters, like you didn't rely on them all the time, and then you had them go out or something, and you did some segments with, without any teleprompter? Yeah, we used to do that quite a bit. I mean, either the teleprompters can go out, or as you're going along, there may be additional information that you're going to deviate from the script from as far as ad living goes. Uh, so that's something that you kind of learn over the years how to do. Some people do it better than others, but it's, it's really more of a skill than anything. Well, and I was going to say because when you're covering such, uh, you know, content that relies on on truth, it's kind of you know like you have all of your notes in there. Do you find it challenging? I mean, you really have to know your topic in order not to. Absolutely. Well, one thing that people don't realize about like Reality Check is that I I was the the host, but also the producer and the writer and the researcher for it. Right? There was no team that put it together. It was one guy. It was me doing it, uh, which is very very unusual in a in a broadcast setting that you have one person who produces anything. Most of the time you have writers, you have producers, uh, you have researchers, you have reporters, and then the anchor is the one who ultimately reads what everyone else has put together. That's the way it typically works. Uh, in my case it was not like that. So since I was responsible for all of the research, you could have turned the teleprompter off and I could have just told you about it uh, you know, with, with no problem at all. Well, and see, and that's, that's kind of like old school, too, because I know, I mean, and probably most of them were, you didn't really want to work with you because maybe they saw you as a kook or something because <laughs> some of the stories you were reporting on, you know, I mean, it wasn't getting done in the mainstream, so they were probably like, ah, I don't really want anything to do with that. Well, um, I can't really ask people to research on, on things that they're not, they're, not, they're not really believers in, right? So uh -huh. it doesn't mean you have to be an ideologue, but if, 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 to the point you're making, if you think that that stuff's, well, that's just kind of weird, I'm not really interested, don't even mess with it because th their heart won't be in it. The the um, commitment to it won't be there. Exactly, and that, it's not like the days of a uh, like Ted Koppel and and those guys that actually were, you know, active journalists out there gathering their own stories and coming back and reporting them. That's right. That's right. The, the business has changed a lot, and it's funny too because uh, every new station is trying to revert back to that where they get their anchor to go out and, and report on something or have a franchise, as they call it. A franchise is basically like a consumer report, something that the anchor faces on. But again, 90% of the time, that's prepackaged content that they're buying from a distributor, and then they have their anchor stand up and read. You know, in a week, they may record a week's worth of in, what are called intros and outros, which is just the anchor standing there reading. Then they go into a voicing room and they voice over a script that somebody else wrote that they themselves have never researched. And they know nothing about it, but it looks right. like <laughs> they researched. Well, it, it, it reminds me of the, the Conan O'Brien bit where the, you know, they all say the exact same thing. It doesn't matter what network or what. It, it just kind of cracks me up because it just shows you that there's really no journal, journalists out there anymore. They're just reading a teleprompter. Yeah, well, and, and the way that works is typically you have, uh, so almost every station in the country will have affiliate service agreements, uh, most of them with the Associated Press. And so, you know, big companies own all these different individual stations, so the company will have a deal with AP, and that means they receive what are called AP wires, or Reuters wires, or Fox wires, CBS wires. And so they're sitting there in their newsroom, and then these stories come down. Well, what Conan is doing is he's just pulling uh, a script where that's come down on the AP wire, right? So it goes out to all these TV stations. Some producer sitting in a newsroom copies that script, they paste it into the show, and then the anchors read it. Um, it really comes down to the fact that there's this increased number of hours every day when news is being created, 
um, but a, a decrease in the number of people actually doing the work. And so you just have to get as much content out as you can. It's, it's qual uh, quantity over quality. And so that's what happens there. The thing that should really stand out to people is not so much that everyone's repeating it. It's that if everyone is taking what the AP says as gospel, then no one is fact-checking. And that's mm -hmm. where you should be concerned, is not that everyone's repeating the same. If everyone's telling you the truth and they're all repeating the same thing, so what? The problem is if an anchor and a producer say, well, it's on the wire, so it must be true, and they send that out and everyone just reads it, then no one is verifying any of that information. That's, that's the real problem with that kind of, of uh, system. Well, and that's what I absolutely love about your videos because you can tell that you fact check before you open your mouth and, and, and you actually show during your videos the, the facts there on the screen and I love the way that you produce those because it just shows that you know you care about the story that you're, I mean you've actually done your research and I just feel like the mainstream media doesn't do that. I mean they, how many times now are we seeing them come back and apologize for something that they read? Right, or, or, or hide it, and you know, it's some other media comes out and says, oh, we caught them, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. you, know, you get like CBS 60 Minutes, right, with the, the guy, the Benghazi guy, remember, who made up his story. They ran the whole thing, and then the next day, oh, sorry, sorry about that. We kind of messed up. So yep. <laughs> fact, we had a story um, you know, that we ran on Vinswan.com just the other day that was, it was uh, I didn't write it. It was actually one of our reporters who put it together, but it was based on a satire site. He didn't realize it was a satire. And so it was, the story was made up about Daryl Issa pursuing uh, charges against BLM and Harry Reid, right? It goes up uh -huh. within a very short time. Um, I'm not sure who spotted it, because by the time that I saw it, it had already been pulled. Uh, but that we pulled it immediately within probably 20 minutes of it going up. Uh, and so my job was to get with that reporter, find out what happened, you know, wh what did you base this on, and then going through this process with them, and then saying, now your next job is to write a new story explaining how you got fooled, right? apologizing to people, and so we did together. I helped him to craft that, and we apologized. We put it up on our homepage saying, here's a story we screwed up, right? This was not true, uh, and making sure that we were as, as transparent as possible because that's all you really have in this business, the ability to share with people. If I'm wrong, then I'll, then I'll be the first to admit it, hopefully, before somebody else comes along and catches me. Yep, well, and that's always been my philosophy. It's not that you're not going to make mistakes. It's what, how you handle the mistakes once you've made them and then just you know, admitting the mistake and, and moving on. That's right, absolutely. The problem is when people are looking for truth, they, they understand that in this sea of news and this sea of information out there uh, that everyone gets fooled sometimes. I mean, national media gets it wrong, right? Uh, but people don't hold them to the same standard, right? The expectation is, well, they're, they're all kind of a joke anyways, and no one really believes them. CNN can go on air and, and come up with all kinds of crazy stuff during the Boston bombing, and their information's all over the place. Remember when this happened a year ago? Um, they were wrong on so many things. They never came back and said they were wrong. They just kept updating the story as they went along, right? An update is not clarification that you were wrong. <laughs> You know, so it, it, it is an interesting time because the, the news cycle is so fast. How do you overcome that? And we should have done a better job, and of course we will continue to, in the future, improve you know, standards for how we put stuff out. Well, and, and, and going to, like, are you able to, like, as completely shut down and, and turn off technology, or do you find, you know, you always have to be connected because you're waiting for that breaking story or you're, you're looking for something to come across the social media channels or whatever? So are you able to shut it off, and if so, how long, and do you go through withdrawals? <laughs> a couple of hours a day. Um, you know, I try to, to set aside a couple of hours, especially around dinner time with my family, when I'm not plugged into any of that. Um, I would say it's worse now that I'm independent than it was when I was even uh, at you know different broadcast stations because when you're with other people, there's always somebody kind of manning the desk, if you will, manning the helm, um, so that if something breaks. But when it's your operation, you can't really do that. So I find that I'm, I'm plugged in a lot more than I probably should be and constantly checking and constantly what's happening, what's the very latest. We're, we're not really interested um, as much in being the first with a whole bunch of information as being the first to give you something that other people aren't giving you. So um, not really in a rush to necessarily get breaking stories so much as finding those bits of information that other people don't provide. Okay, so as far as uh, your top three songs, and I know a lot of people, this this, uh, this is one of the hardest questions because they, there's music changes on a weekly basis. Like there's one week where Blind Pilot's my favorite, then the next week Civil Wars are my favorite. So what are your current top three songs on your playlist or your top three favorite songs? 
Uh, well, I, the top two that come to mind, top three I'm not sure about, but top two for sure, uh, Imagine Dragons, Demons, love that song. A huge yep. fan of them, that's what they're doing. Uh, and then probably number, that's probably number two. Number one right now, which would have bumped it, is um, Ordinary Love by U2. Big, mm -hmm. fan of, uh, big fan of what they're doing. I mean, a lot of what we do is this humanity is greater than politics idea, and I love I love kind of the message of that song and, and what it's about. And, and uh, I know if you watch the video, there are some people who go and watch it, and they're like, that's a Nelson Mandela video. They're talking about Nelson Mandela. And they get all fired <laughs> up, right? Nelson Mandela is a socialist. Listen, um, if Nelson Mandela is a socialist, so what? If he was a communist, so what? It doesn't change the fact that there was good that came out of his life for a whole lot of people uh, living in South Africa. And apartheid was a horrible thing, and he was the one who fought to change that. I don't care about all the, the elements of his life, whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. I just know good things came out of his life. And if you really have a problem with that, then shame on, on you and the you know, capitalists, libertarians, anarchists, whoever it might be, who weren't there fighting against apartheid. Um, if, if you really believe that, then we should have been the ones out there first doing that. I, I agree with you. So now, are there any gadgets that are coming out in the near future that you've read about or anything that you're really looking forward to getting? Ooh, that's a really good question. So I, I want to get a drone, right, so that I can continue to shoot video, but with those drones that are up in the sky, I really like that uh, and hoping to do that. haven't really been in a position where it would be very useful yet. That's why I've, I've uh, hesitated to do so. Uh, so I really haven't messed with that too much. The other thing is, as I'm looking at different ways to build out what we're doing in terms of our space around us uh, and our and our kind of set, uh, really want to do some stuff with touch screens and, and see what we can do to enhance uh, our content with that, but just haven't been able to, to get into it yet. Still interested, by the way, in Google Glass, uh, but mm -hmm. not sure exactly how that's all going to work and how much metadata is being gathered on me when I'm walking around looking at stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, it's that's, that's one of those things where I mean I I have I like the wearable technology, but you know as far as the the glass, the Google Glass, I'm just really not sold on it yet. So I'm I'm I would like to see a pair and see you know what they're about, uh, but you know I, in in your position doing an interview, you know you can have them. That's know, true. Just, so I, it, it yeah. would be kind of good, but yeah, absolutely, that would be cool. Hey, do you have the the Samsung Watch? Is that what you have on your arm? Yeah, the, the Pebble. This is the Pebble Watch. Pebble Watch, okay. Yeah. See, I, Which, I looked at one of those also with the Samsung, but you can't do with the 3. you got to have the 4 in order to do it at least. Um, but the problem is you still have to have your phone with you. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. The, the, I didn't really like the Samsung uh, wearables. I mean, they, they were kind of clunky to me. The Pebble, I, I, I do have my phone, but I am actually able to completely silence it in my pocket, and then I can decide whether I want it to ring my phone and my text messages, uh, that I can read, so I can pretty much never have my phone ring or interrupt anything. My my watch just vibrates, and I just look over. Oh, it's a text from my wife. I better answer that one, or it's a text from my brother. I'll get it later. I just hit a button, and I'm done. How so easy it, is text on it? Uh, well, you can't to send text, but you can read them. So oh, yeah. it like just comes in, and you can see what the text message is, and then I can say, oh, okay, if I want to respond, then I do got to pull out my phone. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the only thing I don't like about it is I, I'm with you. I love the idea of wearable technology. Um, I love the idea of, of making something you know compact. The only problem I have is now I'm responsible for two devices, so you know, <laughs> all over the place. So if there's a way to, to put all that into one, maybe we can make it into like a big old honking armband, you know, make it like a big tattooed sleeve. Yeah, like Batman gloves. Gloves. <laughs> Go. Like a text message. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So uh, tell everybody where they can find you. Absolutely. You can find me at benswan.com. On Facebook, it is uh, Ben Swan. Just type that into the search bar. We'll come up. We've got two pages, so you can like them both. Why not? Uh, but if not, our main page is Ben Swan. Uh, on Twitter, it's Ben Swan underscore. There's someone squatting on my, my Twitter page, Ben <laughs> Swan. So I'm still trying to get that from them. So right now, you got to use an underscore at the end to find us. Uh, and on Google Plus, it's, it's uh, Google Plus Ben, I think, or something like that. See, I'm, okay. I'm so terrible at Google+. Plus. I don't even know how to find myself there. <laughs> Reach out to me about the Twitter thing. Uh, I might be able to help. Um, awesome. and, and just so you know, it's Ben Swan, B-E-N-S-W-A-N-N, two N's, dot com. Uh, and, so, and then find him on Google+. Plus. We'll have links in the show notes and stuff for you to find him and hook up with him. Uh, thank you so much, Ben, for joining us. And uh, anything you want to close with? Just want to say thank you, David. Uh, everything that you're doing, man, you're a rock star. It's great to be connected to you. 
Um, and I love the fact that you have uh, Captain America behind you since he's against drones. <laughs> yes. Well, and I just went and saw Winter Soldier, and I was like really excited about the content. And I don't know if you noticed my uh, my sleeve is actually oh, the Captain awesome. America crest. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. We just did a video about that, just pointing out to people that that the message in that is very strong. It's against the surveillance state and against this kill list and all that. So uh, I'm I'm really excited about taking my boys to go see it because that's the kind of stuff we need to see more of in, in Hollywood. Exactly. Well, and the thing is, I even said it's better than the first Iron Man. It is by far, to me, the best Marvel film that has been made yet. So Awesome. Outstanding. Right. Well, I can't wait to go see it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, remember to circle us on Google Plus at Plus Geek Beat, and we'll see you next time. Until then, stay geeky, my friends.